You want to do a mic check? Can you hear it here? Microphone check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Microphone check. You're not getting that? And molt, did you kill your tone? Microphone check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You had tone up, didn't you? Check, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What? Hold what? Microphone check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Some microphone check for C-SPAN. Microphone check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is that good? Microphone check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is a microphone check from the chairman's seat in 20, what, 2172. Check, check. Down to the witness. Microphone check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Check, check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Some microphone check from the witness in 2172. Rayburn. Check, check, check on a snowy Tuesday. Check, check, check in December 2013. Microphone check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten.
The uh, subcommittee will come to order, subcommittees, I should say. And this is a important and, and um, unique uh, day. It is Human Rights Day, and uh, both the subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, and Human Rights, and my distinguished colleague, Ileana Ross Layton, uh, and her subcommittee are combined today in, in, in chairing this hearing and, and raising the issues of human rights abuse uh, in Egypt. Today's hearing examines the escalating human rights abuses in Egypt. In it is fitting uh, that we are holding this hearing today on International Human Rights Day, December 10th, because we are witnessing grievous violence and other abuses directed against religious and political minorities, particularly the cops and other Christians about uh, which our government and the media has said far too little, which seems to be a pattern worldwide. I would note parenthetically that the persecutions of Christians is escalating. Witness the slaughter of Christians in the Central Africa Republic, CAR. I would note Bishop Nungo of the CAR told my committee just a few weeks ago in this room that Christians were being targeted simply because of their faith, while the United Nations, the United States, and the rest of the world looked on. On Thursday, uh, I will be chairing a hearing on American Pastor Saeed Abedini, who was jailed and is suffering torture in Iran. Pastor Abedini's wife, Nagme, will tell our committee on Thursday, and I quote in part, while I am th thankful for President Obama's willingness to express concern about my husband and the other imprisoned Americans in Iran during his recent phone conversation with Iran's new president, Hassan Rouhani, Rouhani, I was devastated to learn that the administration didn't even ask for my husband's release, which directly when directly seated across the table from the leaders of the government that holds him captive. She goes on to say, my husband is suffering because he is a Christian. He is suffering because he is an American. Yet his own government, at least the executive and diplomatic representatives, have abandoned him. Don't we owe it to him as a nation to stand up for his human rights and for his freedom? Unfortunately, there seems to be a pattern. After President Mubarak resigned in February of 2011, the world hoped for a new Egypt, a just government for all Egyptians, which would not make the, uh, and replicate President Mubarak's mistakes, but reality has been just the opposite. Horrific anti-Christian pogroms have taken place under each of the post-Mubarak governments. For some of these abuses, the governments bear the responsibility of an action. For others, they bear direct responsibility. In recent months, undercurrents of abuse and contempt for human dignity, long existing in Egypt have turned into flash floods of violence. For example, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces presided over the Maspero protest massacre in October of 2011. At least 25 people were killed and more than 300 injured, almost all of them cops, when the military drove trucks through the crowd and used live ammunition against the unarmed protesters. Under the now displaced Morsi government, Three low-level soldiers involved were charged with minor crimes and received two to three year sentences. No commanding officers were held responsibility for ordering or failing to prevent the deadly assaults. While Mr. Morsi and of the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party at times voiced support for an Egypt that was home to both Muslims and Christians, his inaction belied his rhetoric. In April of 2012, St. Mark's Cathedral, seat of the Coptic Pope, was attacked by 30 to 40 Muslim youths. While dozens of cops were sheltering inside, security forces joined the mob. Rather than dispersing the crowd, they participated in the all-night attack or stood idly by as rocks, gasoline bombs, and gas canisters were lob lobbied and lobbed, I should say, into the iconic cathedral. Despite this, President Morsi denied that the clash was sectarian in nature. After Mr. Morsi was removed in July of this year, the military ended the Muslim Brotherhood sit-in with violence, killing hundreds of protesters. Tragically, some in the Muslim Brotherhood scapegoated the cops, although the cops had nothing to do with the military's violent response. On August 14th, the day that we remembered as the worst day for cops in some 700 years, 37 churches, five schools, and three Bible societies, four other Christian institutions in many homes and businesses were burned or damaged by mobs. More than 100 deaths were documented in the initial spate of violence in, and its aftermath. 
Some cops have charged the military government in Egypt with allowing the attacks on Coptic persons, businesses, churches, and homes to continue, often inside of police stations and in spite of repeated and direct calls for help in order to solidify government power as an alternative to the Muslim Brotherhood, as well as to justify their own heavy-handed crackdown on the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood denies any involvement in the attacks occurring across the country and has at times condemned them. Yet the Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party branch in Helwyn reportedly posted a statement holding the Coptic Pope responsible for Morsi's removal and otherwise linked cops to attacks on the Muslim Brotherhood. The Brotherhood also called for Friday prayers to be held in an evangelical church in Minya after it had occupied it and converted it to a mosque on August 15th. Whoever the attackers are, and that is one thing we hope to learn more about today, the bottom line is that Coptic citizens are having their most basic human rights, freedom of religion, association, and equal protection of the laws denied. We can never rest until human dignity, when it is so grossly trampled upon, nor can we ever accept the suffering that has marked Coptic life for decades, very much including the abductions, forced conversions, and forced marriages of Coptic girls and women. These abuses have continued unabated, and by some reports have escalated sharply uh, following the Arab Spring, as have the abuse of the Egyptian courts to prosecute blasphemy cases against Christians, moderate Muslims, and secularists. Moreover, despite the nearly $1.5 million in foreign aid American taxpayers give to Egypt each year, neither the Mubarak government nor the Morsi government, or now the military government, has seen fit to return kidnapped American children, Noor and Ramsey Bauer, who were abducted by their mother to Egypt in 2009 in violation of a valid U.S. court order uh, to the United States. They, along with some 30 other American children in Egypt, are forced to live without the love and guidance of an American parent who daily fights for their return while being stripped of half of their culture and half of their identity. In addition, freedom of expression continues to be under fire. The current interim government has been arresting and jailing journalists critical to the military government, jamming the broadcast signals, deporting foreign reporters, and otherwise closing the offices of news outlets that are, quote, broadcasting lies. In September of 23rd speech at the United Nations, the president stated that his approach to Egypt reflected a larger point. The U.S. at times, at all, at, will at times work with governments that do not meet the highest international expectations, but will work with them on our own core interests. These core interests were early defined in the speech to include the Camp David Accords and counterterrorism efforts, but I believe mistakenly have not included human rights. Human rights and the intrinsic dignity of every human being from womb to tomb are important in and of themselves. But for those who fail to grasp this, there is another important point to be made. It is the strategic interest of the United States to encourage governments to respect the rights of their own people because governments that fail to do so are in the final analysis unstable. This should be the abiding lesson of the Arab Spring. The president also stated that future U.S. support to Egypt will, quote, depend on Egypt's progress in pursuing a democratic path. Again, it is unclear what that criteria entails. What if the democratic path does not include the protection of human rights, such as we see, saw under the Morsi government and now the interim government? It is not democracy per se that is to be the goal, but rather duly elected constitutional government that respects minorities, the separation of power, and fundamental human rights. Tyranny of the majority is not an acceptable option. What is clear is that the U.S. needs a new approach. This administration's short-sighted approach of not clearly linking aid to the protection of human rights in Egypt has been unequivocally ineffective. It is my hope that our hearing today will shed light on what went wrong and how the U.S. can be more effective in protecting human rights going forward. I yield to my good friend and distinguished uh, colleague, 
Chairman, Chairwoman Ileana Rosley. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you for your leadership uh, throughout the years on uh, any uh, issue related to, uh, to human rights, and thank you for uh, shedding some, uh, some light on this uh, terrible human rights abuse that is going on in Egypt. It is an honor to, uh, to hold this hearing with you. Thank you, sir. Uh, during the Morsi and Muslim-led, uh, Muslim Brotherhood-led era, we witnessed a steady increase in human rights abuses perpetrated by the Islamist government as Morsi began to solidify his power and crack down on fundamental freedoms of Egyptians. There was a precipitous increase in the arrests of journalists, a widespread crackdown on opposition demonstrators, wanton disrespect for the rule of law, and an overall deteriorating state of human rights throughout Egypt. Then this past July, the people of Egypt grew tired of Morsi's oppressive regime and its blatant disregard for human rights, and again took to the streets en, ma en masse. Since Morsi's removal from power, more, uh, Muslim Brotherhood supporters have terrorized the Egyptian people with violent protests, and the end result has left hundreds killed and many more injured. The Egyptian, Egyptian military has responded in kind, and the interim authorities have, have moved to initiate restic restrictive assembly laws. And though the military has taken some steps to keep Egypt safe and secure, such as conducting operations against al-Qaeda in the lawless Sinai, the general security situation, restrictions on civil society, and a lack of, rule, of the rule of law and respect for human rights demonstrate that Egypt still has a long way to go toward creating a truly democratic society. While Egypt's inter interim government has said that it is protecting religious minorities, we still see attacks against Coptic Christian community all the time. Though the government may not outward, outwardly incite these attacks, it fails to provide the adequate protections to prevent them from happening. Christians have seen a drastic increase of attacks against them as they have been scapegoated by Morsi supporters. Horrifying reports of attacks against Christian communities and of young Christian girls being abducted and forced into marriage with radical Islamists depict the grim reality that Christians are currently facing in Egypt. But Christians aren't the only groups that continue to suffer. Other religious minorities, such as Jews, Baha'is, Sufi Muslims, Shiites, and others have been targeted by extremists, and women's rights are woefully inadequate. While the latest draft constitution, in theory, has provided more rights, in practice, it is so left open to interpretation thus not necessarily affording any more rights to those groups who need protection the most. The committee tasked with drawing up this new constitution was not truly representative of the interest of all Egyptians. Of the 50 members, only five were women and only four were Coptic Christians. It is the duty of the interim government to help shepherd Egypt toward a new dawn of democracy. In order for Egypt to return to the path toward democracy, the new constitution must protect the rights of women and religious and ethnic minorities. Everyone's human rights must be recognized and the political party process must be allowed to take root with free, fair, and transparent elections. I hope that the new draft constitution will be implemented in a way that adequately addresses these concerns and is not just simply a document that can be thrown out at a moment's notice. The ideals enshrined in this document must be the bedrock foundation that can inspire a country that is in danger of losing its way. A successful democratic transition in Egypt can only occur once those protections are respected are solidified and enforced. In addition, Egyptian authorities must pardon the 43 NGO workers, many of whom are American citizens who were unjustly convicted and sentenced earlier this year and allow the NGOs to operate without fear of government reprisals as they help to support civil society. The path to democracy is a difficult one, but it would be a tremendous accomplishment if the people of Egypt can implement the democratic reforms they have called for and realize a free and functioning civil society. Without a strong basis in democracy, any elections 
will fail to achieve the democratic results we all hope and pray to see in Egypt. And I thank the chairman again for the joint hearing. I want to thank the distinguished uh, chairwoman for her very eloquent statement and for her never-ending efforts to combat human rights worldwide. Um, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Ross Layton. Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And I want to echo my colleague to the left. I want to associate myself with her remarks. She did a great job. Uh, you're exactly correct. We need to address this when we make policy that should be uh, utmost and foremost on our mindset. If we don't, then we are, as the scripture says, a clanging gong and tingling symbols, tinkling symbols, symbols. So uh, we want to make sure that we pay close attention and the policy that we set holds these people to account. We express our concern, our love, and our intent to put an end to these human rights violations across the globe, but especially in Egypt and that we set the policy in place to do that. And I commend you once again for holding this hearing. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Chairman Rohrbacher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Today, we hope that we will be sending the message that the people of the United States are standing in solidarity with those oppressed Christians who are suffering persecution in Egypt. That's the message of today. But the greater message is that the people of the United States believe in religious freedom. We believe that people, no matter what their faith, have a right to live their lives as they choose without being persecuted or brutalized by either their government or by the citizens of the country in which they reside. The United States is on the side of those people who believe in freedom, and we are on the side of those who are persecuted for their beliefs, whether they be Christians, or whether they be Muslims, whether they be Buddhist, or whether they be atheists. The fact is our country was founded on those principles, but far too often uh, our government has not had the courage to act upon those beliefs, which are supposed to be the fundamental beliefs that we have held since the beginning of our country. So today, Mr. Chairman, I would hope that we reaffirm, not just in words, but are willing to reaffirm in policy and in deed that when people, especially as we focus on the Christians in Egypt, are being uh, brutalized, that we will not stand idly by and not just express our words, but stand with those in Egypt who would end that oppression. And uh, uh, this is a, today, unfortunately, uh, there seems to be confusion in our government as to whose side we should be on. We are on the side of those people who want freedom and not radicals who would uh, repress their own fellow citizens. So today, we welcome our witnesses. I thank the chairman for calling this hearing so that we can express these very important sentiments of solidarity for a people who are being persecuted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rohrbacher. Uh, Ms. Frankel. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you for being here. Uh, I, I uh, joined Mr. Rohrbacher, um, I think it was last month we went, we went to Cairo, and uh, we, we met with General Sisi and acting President Mansour, and also we, we met with the Coptic Pope there. It was a very short but interesting uh, visit. Uh, I'm really just looking forward to seeing, hearing what you have to say. Uh, we, when we were there, uh, we were assured by uh, General Sisi and President Mansour uh, that they were redrafting a constitution um, and that uh, this would be the first critical step back towards democracy. Uh, so I, of course, would be interested in hearing uh, about that. And of course, the Coptic Pope did, did uh, talk about some of the uh, uh, repression and abuses. 
Uh, and so I would certainly uh, be interested in hearing about that. And again, I, I thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Ms. Frankel. I'd like to recognize uh, Chairman Frank Wolf and just note parenthetically that Mr. Wolf, our first witness, Dr. Zudi Jasser, is with the uh, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Uh, Mr. Wolf, in 1998, was the author of the International Religious Freedom Act, which not only created a State Department uh, effort and a, an office, but also a parallel organization that has been, has spoken truth to power ever since. Uh, when state has fallen short, but more importantly, uh, has been absolutely robust in bringing human rights issues and religious freedom uh, issues uh, to the forefront. But that bill, that law, was written by Chairman Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. I don't serve on the committee, uh, and I. So, but I want to thank uh, Mr. Smith and all the all the members of this committee. This is almost the last bastion in the Congress that really holds hearings and deals with these issues. Uh, uh, last week, the House of Commons did a three-hour debate. You couldn't get a three-hour debate in the House or the Senate if you paid for it. And if, if, it, if it were not for the members of this committee, all of you, uh, this issue may very well go away. Uh, Mr. Rohrbacher talked about uh, our ob obligation. President Reagan, who he was a speechwriter for, said that the words in the Constitution were a covenant not only with the people in Philadelphia in 1787, but with all the people of the world. They're covenant with the, with the people of Cairo. They're covenant with the people of Alexandria. They're covenant with the people all, all over the world. I believe that we are breaking the covenant at this very moment, and a covenant is more significant than a contract. I believe we're breaking the covenant. And I, I, I visited uh, uh, each a couple of months ago, we met with women's groups. They all believe that our government was the strongest supporter of the Morsi government. We met with uh, uh, Muslim groups. They believe that our government was the strongest supporter of the Muslim, uh, of the Muslim brother. We met with the Christian groups. They all believe that we were the strongest supporter of the Morsi government. They believe that Ann Patterson and the American Embassy was not a, a sanctuary of freedom, but it was basically a, a support group for the Morsi government. And also, we met with a number in the secular community. So again, a thank thanks committee. I, I, I think we could lose Egypt. I think we are really facing a point. If we, this administration doesn't deal with certain things, and they're going to be here for the next three, three years, we could lose Egypt. And then the stories will be, who lost Egypt? And the answer will be, the Obama administration and the Congress lost Egypt because they did not side with the people of Egypt who want freedom and democracy against the Muslim Brotherhood. So I thank uh, Mr. Smith and all the members here. If it were not for you guys, men and women, this issue just would not be dealt with. Thank you, Chairman Wolf. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this important hearing. Thank you for being here. It's good to see you. Uh, you know, obviously, the transition of power is never easy. Uh, it's, it's always uh, combined with uh, not only cultural but religious di differences among protests many times and, and trying to, to scream for power. What I am interested in hearing uh, from you the, this morning is, is how can we help uh, provide a standard. I think what we've heard across this uh, today has been that there is really not a dependable standard on what we expect. Uh, and if you go all the way back uh, to Cuba and some of the other, we, we knew what that was about. I lived in Florida at the time and I knew the human rights abuses that were happening there because we could feel them. We, we heard the stories. And yet, uh, the story is not getting told, whether it's in Egypt or across the Middle East. And so how can we as members of Congress come alongside you, support this effort, and make sure that it gets highlighted? Uh, at this same, uh, you know, at your same table, we had uh, people talking about NGOs and how they had been uh, convicted in absentia and, and how they felt like Congress had left them out and was not, you know, they were not bringing those issues to the forefront. And so I look forward to hearing your testimony on how we can not only highlight this issue, but how we can make a difference. And uh, for those that are persecuted that perhaps do not have a voice, uh, it is critical that we we have this as important as so many of the issues are. It is, it is critical that we use this uh, not to ignore human rights abuses in favor of uh, uh, economic stability or whatever it is, but let's tie those together, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Meadows. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Bilirakis. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairman uh, Ross Layden, as well. Uh, this is such a very important issue. Uh, and uh, because of your leadership, uh, we continue to focus on this. And it's so very important to me and my constituents. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity again to participate since the safety of Coptic Christians in Egypt is something that I've worked on since I've been in Congress. As an Orthodox Christian and a member of the International Religious Freedom Caucus, I'm especially alarmed at the dwindling number of Christians in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Egypt, and throughout the Middle East. While this hearing today focuses on Egypt, and it should, I want to take a moment to reiterate that Christians are facing persecution across the region. Christianity is not new to the Middle East, and we must not forget that the ancient indigenous uh, communities of Coptic, Syrian, Assyrian, Catholic, and Greek Orthodox communities that have lived and thrived in the Middle East for thousands of years. Today, in the face of ongoing unrest, these Christians have exhibited bravery in the face of existential danger. These attempts that we see to push Christians from their ancestral homeland, let us not forget that Coptic translated means Egyptian. These attempts must be denounced by all. I thank the chairman, of course, Ross Lanham and Chairman Smith uh, for holding this hearing today, and I remain committed to working with my colleagues in the House to continue bringing light to the situation in Egypt and across the Middle East. I would like to thank the panelists again for being here today. I thank them for their testimony. I have met with many of you to discuss the topic at hand over the past year, and while I wish I could say that things have improved over that time, I'm afraid they have not. So let's continue to work on behalf of these wonderful people. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bilarakis. I'd now introduce our first uh, witness, panel number one, uh, which is Dr. Zudi Jasser, who is a member of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He is also the founder and past president of the American Islamic Forum for Democracy. Dr. Jasser is a first-generation American Muslim whose parents fled the oppressive Ba'ath regime in, of Syria. He earned his medical degree on the, a U.S. Navy scholarship and served 11 years in the United States Navy. Uh, he achieved the rank of lieutenant commander. His tours of duty included uh, medical department head aboard the USS El Paso, chief resident at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and staff internist for the Office of the Attending Physician for the U.S. Congress. He is recipient of the Meritorious Service Medal uh, he is a respected physician currently in private practice specializing in internal medicine and nuclear car cardiology. He is the past president of the Arizona, Arizona Medical Association. He has been a frequent uh, speaker on behalf of human rights and religious freedom, he has been before our committee before, and we have always benefited greatly from his wise counsel and insight. Dr. Jesser. Uh, thank you, Chairman Smith, and uh, I want to thank the members of the subcommittees on Africa, global health, uh, global human rights, and international organizations in the Middle East and North Africa for holding this very important hearing on human rights in Egypt and inviting the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom to testify. Uh, with your approval, I'd like to submit my written testimony, which also reflects uh, what we've learned in our delegation to Egypt in February uh, for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Today could not be a more appropriate day to hold this hearing, given that 65 years ago, 48 nations in the UN General Assembly adopted a remarkable document that is relevant today as it was then, the UN Declaration on Human Rights, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Yet today, too many governments, including Egypt, fail to honor human rights. Among the recent convulsions in Egypt, few have been more shocking or emblematic of the January 2011 revolution's derailment than the Egyptian security forces killing more than 1,000 demonstrators in August, and then the horrific attacks by extremists and the Muslim Brotherhood supporters against the country's Coptic Christian population. Today, I want to highlight the plight of the Copts and the other religious minorities and Muslim dissidents and briefly review the new constitution and conclude with recommendations on protecting religious freedom for everyone in Egypt. Since the transition's beginning, Egyptian human rights activists have been concerned that radical groups have advanced the country with detrimental effects on fostering an open civil society and democratic reform and improving freedom of religion or belief. 
During former President Morsi's year in power, sectarian rhetoric and incitement increased significantly with conservative clerics and extremists without consequence or accountability, fanning the flames of hatred. The most vilified groups included Christians, Shia, Baha'is, and all religious minorities. In fact, five Shia were lynched to death in June as a consequence of increased sectarian incitement to violence by jihadi and Salafi groups. While the government has failed to bring the, to justice the perpetrators of sectarian attacks, the courts have continued to charge, convict, and imprison Egyptian citizens for blasphemy, contempt, and defamation of religions. Since Egypt's 2011 revolution, our commission has observed a significant increase in these cases, with disfavored Muslims being the most targeted. However, Christians are disproportionately affected. In September 2013, just a few months ago, a leading Egyptian human rights organization reported a significant surge in religious defamation cases and identified 63 cases of individuals, 41% being Christian, a percentage out of proportion to their population. The cops are particularly affected and victims of impunity for those who target them. Besides directly violating religious freedom, blasphemy and defamation of religion laws fuel Egypt's longtime impunity problem by provoking assaults against cops and other religious minorities for alleged blasphemous speech. Large-scale attacks on Christians during 2011 resulted in the deaths of dozens and injuries to hundreds, with the perpetrators remaining unpunished to this day, inviting further violence. Following Morsi's July ouster, violent attacks again increased, targeting cops and other Christians. Since mid-August, at least seven cops have been killed and more than 200 churches and other places where Christians congregated have been assaulted, many of which destroyed. In October, four cops were killed, including two children. Beside cops, other vulnerable religious minorities have faced assaults on their religious freedom. My written testimony briefly reviews the status of the Baha'is, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the continued growing anti-Semitism. Let me note here that Egypt has banned the Baha'i faith and Jehovah's Witnesses since 1960s, and that in 2012, material vilifying Jews continued to appear regularly in Egypt's state-controlled and semi-official media. Egypt's 50-member st constitution uh, uh, committee recently completed its work and sent the final draft to the Egyptian interim president. The draft will be put to referendum coming this January. An initial review shows the removal of some problematic provisions from the suspended 2012 constitution and other positive additions, although how the provisions are interpreted and implemented will be crucial. For example, Article 64 of the new draft provides freedom of belief being absolute. Article 65 broadly guarantees freedom of thought and opinion, and 53 prohibits discrimination on the basis of religion, among other grounds. But like the Morsi era constitution, Article 64 limits the freedom to practice religious rituals and establish practices of worship to only three divine religions. Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, thereby not allowing the Baha'i community to exercise their own rights and establish places of worship. And even that freedom is limited with Christians having limitation on being able to build new churches and other manifestations of that. In the end, our recommendations are number one, due to Egypt's failure to protect the religious freedom and even the lives of its people, USER for the third consecutive year recommended that the U.S. designate Egypt a country of particular concern the U.S. must urge Egypt to repeal its contempt of religion and related laws, its penal code, and discriminatory decrees against religious minorities. Given the continued violence against cops and other religious minorities, the U.S. should press Egypt to prosecute government-funded clerics, officials, and others who incite violence and urge Cairo to pr bring the violent to justice. Finally, the U.S. should refuse to certify the disbursement of the appropriated $1.3 billion in foreign military financing to the Egyptian military until the Egyptian government demonstrates that it's using some of the FMF funds to implement policies that protect freedom and related rights. Once the Egyptian government so demonstrates, it should be urged to ensure that its police implement a comprehensive plan to protect religious minority communities and their places of worship. Congress should require the State Department to report every 90 days on the Egyptian government's progress on these and related recommendations. The treatment of Egypt's religious minority communities is a barometer of the country's well-being. If the Egyptian revolution is to succeed, nothing is more important than ensuring that Egypt's government recognize the full freedom of religion or belief being a fundamental human right. For the sake of stability and security, and because of Egypt's international human rights commitments, the U.S. government should urge Egypt to choose the pathway to democracy and freedom. Thank you.
Dr. Jasser, thank you so very much for your leadership and for your, your extraordinary statement. In his testimony, Bishop uh, Angelos, uh, His Grace Bishop Angelos, makes the point that religious minorities in general, Copts, Jews, Shiite, Sufi, and Baha'i, are suffering attacks in large part because of a breakdown in the law and order. Uh, you have pointed out that although the true test will be, uh, there are changes being made in the Constitution, the true test will be uh, as to how the Egyptian government interprets and, and implements the new document once passed by re referendum. Um, is the Constitution really going to make a difference in, in reforming these, the abuse of these blasphemy laws? Uh, you also point out uh, that there is a surge in religious defamation cases, particularly since January 2011. Um, including in the two months after Morsi was removed from power. Uh, there's a 100 percent of the individuals who were accused and tried were found guilty. Uh, maybe you could speak to what is causing this surge in blasphemy cases, and again, will the new Constitution mitigate uh, uh, that abuse? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, these are really key questions in that, you know, we can always try to give uh, a government a honeymoon period, if you will, as they reboot and uh, re try to course correct their democracy. Uh, but the bottom line is that uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that while there's a rush to uh, um, take to trial those who are uh, arrested or, or uh, brought to justice supposedly for blasphemy and uh, restrictions on freedom of speech, those who commit acts of violence are not brought to justice. So certain uh, phrases in the Constitution that we see some of the articles I mentioned uh, are hopeful. Uh, there are some things that we should be concerned about in that uh, um, they have a limitation on freedom of speech uh, discussing incitement to hate. It's not the standard that we agreed to uh, even at 1618 that talked about a, a limitation on incitement to violence or imminent violence. That's not the standard they're using. So there's a, a large gaping hole there that can allow the current regime, the current government to continue in a way that uh, would not respect uh, human rights and freedom of speech. And there's an opportunity now. I think as much as uh, uh, there was clear uh, a direction downward and backward during the Morsi uh, uh, regime in which uh, there was uh, a loss of human rights. Uh, uh, the Constitution was an Islamist document that limited, uh, was based in Sharia and other aspects that were not based in freedom. Uh, now is an opportunity. And I think what we need and what, in our recommendations that we're laying out is that our policy needs to be linked to religious freedom. What happened is you saw the violence that happened in August uh, against the Coptic and Christian communities. And it took until October until there was actually a mention that we would limit funding and, and restrict some of the uh, um, uh, military funds. So there was no connection there. And then sometimes it was referred to criticism of the Brotherhood. And, and meanwhile, as many of uh, the other members have stated, it's being interpreted by the world that we did nothing during the Brotherhood year, and now we're doing something once the Brotherhood have left and the people have made a statement. So unless we do things and link them to religious freedom, they're gonna be misinterpreted. It doesn't mean we shouldn't continue to put pressure because of the limitations of the current Constitution and the fact that it has just been a piece of paper, and the only way to make it real is to hold them accountable with measurements every 90 days as we laid out, and then linking that to uh, cases uh, the Hagazi case, uh, the Asfor case, and other cases in which people have been put in jail. These human beings are depictive, as you'll hear from other testimony, of the reality on the ground, which is very different than the Constitution. My time is just about out, but I would just note parenthetically that uh, in the last foreign aid appropriations bill, Frank Wolf, Trent Franks, Kay Granger, and I, and others, got language into the Foreign Office Appropriations Bill linking, conditioning our aid on religious freedom. Sadly, it was waived uh, by Secretary Clinton. Mr. Connolly. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jasser. Thank you. Um, do I understand, well, let me ask it differently. From your testimony, how would you compare uh, the issues of religious freedom in Egypt uh, between the Morsi government and the current military government? Well, it's hard to uh, judge the current military government since they've only been uh, still uh, uh, getting their uh, organization together. Uh, but I, I think on the ground, 
Uh, we see the Constitution shows some improvement. Uh, there have been certain provisions from the Morsi era Constitution that have been removed. Uh, we've seen some aspects that they've gone. Uh, um, there's one Article 235 that talks about allowing uh, separating from government provisions, the building of religious uh, uh, structures, which I think would be very important for the Coptic community to control the building of their own churches that has for long been authorized. There have been no new churches authorized. So there are some things that we're seeing uh, that are very hopeful. With, but on with the respect ground, to religious been, freedom. With respect to religious freedom. No, no, uh, no, no. I, I, I'm just clarifying what you're yeah. saying. You're talking about, because I want to be very clear, there are obviously aspects of the draft constitution current draft constitution that would Americans would find abhorrent. The carve out for the military, the lack of civilian oversight of the defense minister, uh, those, are, those are not democratic provisions. Those are most certainly protections for the, a military government that are not democratic provisions. We would agree. Yes, sir. Yeah. And, and, so and what you're referring to is, this Constitution draft, however, is better than the one previously promulgated with respect to religious freedom. Yes, sir. And, and it's not a binary choice in that the, the voice of the people in Egypt, I think, could be better than either what the Brotherhood brought to the table uh, with Morsi and, and what currently is being brought to the table by uh, President Mansour and, and this Constitutional Committee. But if you look at Morsi's Constitution, every minority abandoned the process. This process has still engaged many of the minority communities in the committee itself, but what it's going to produce, and I, I will agree with you in that on the ground, there has been little change as far as religious freedom. The, the impunity for acts of violence, nobody's been brought to justice for what happened to all of the churches that were desecrated in August. Very little uh, um, uh, justice has been brought with that. So these are the things that need to be targeted. And, and as our commission has been built on the fact that when religious freedom is protected, the rest of society will be healthy. When it's not protected, it will deteriorate. And all the other things you were talking about will never be a success. Great. Just want to make sure that we got that clear on the record. And I, I thank you for your testimony. I know we're under a time bind today, so appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Chairwoman Ileana ross -Layton. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Jasser, thank you for, for your service on, on the commission. And, and for several years, the commission has uh, argued that Egypt should be placed on the country of particular concern list uh, when it comes to the human rights situation there. Uh, what headway do you see that we're making in, in that? What progress? And you also recommend about uh, uh, the disbursement of aid that we were talking about, that the U.S. should refuse to certify the disbursement of our military aid to the Egyptian armed forces. We've already seen many uh, Gulf nations pledge sums of money that uh, dwarfs our $1.3 billion. Do you worry that if we cut off aid, Egypt will get that money elsewhere? We hear that a lot when we, when we talk about uh, conditioning our, our aid and leveraging our aid, and that we would lose whatever leverage uh, we have left, and, and these human rights abuses will continue. So if you could address that one as well. And would you favor an approach in which we transition the foreign military assistance uh, money that we give to economic support funds in which that money could still go to Egypt but would uh, go to building up civil society, democracy promotion programs, uh, some other security programs that Egypt would need in order to maintain its uh, stability and, and security. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair Ross Lane, and, uh, and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Um, there's no doubt, uh, as we designated Egypt uh, as a CPC in 11, 2012, and 13, it has not only not improved, it has continued to worsen. So not only does it deserve that designation, but 2012, especially under Morsi, demonstrated significant strides backwards. And this is why you saw in Revolution 2.0 in Egypt uh, 10 times more demonstrations of people against that government than you saw in the first uh, revolution. And uh, as a result of the criteria by which our commission works in designating CPC status, uh, Egypt fits every one of those as far as specific targeting and egregious uh, offenses and religious freedom. As far as the aid is concerned, uh, I believe, as you mentioned, there can be 90 days review in which that aid doesn't become a lever that you can only pull once, and that is a constant measure of the success or failures that that society is making. If you use, and this is one of our primary criticisms of the current approach of the State Department, is that often 
as, as was mentioned by Chairman Smith, because we were so late and because then it was waived in 2011, 2012, uh, the certification was waived. There's specific benchmarks that was legislated by this body that Egypt should meet in elections and in human rights, et cetera, that it has not met. And when it was ready to decertify that funding when we should have with the Brotherhood, it did not happen and it was waived. And now it appears when we're doing it in October 2013 that we're somehow uh, rewarding the Brotherhood. And this is why we have to get the timing right, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't link that to civil society progress and methods in which we link it every 90 days to progress on the ground that protects women's groups, that protects religious minorities, shows that some of these cases that we've highlighted in my written testimony are actually being, being released. And we have a program in which members of Congress can uh, um, identify um, individuals in jail that they can then promote as being examples of how Egypt and other countries can fix themselves. Thank you very much, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Ms. Franklin. Thank you. Again, a welcome and thank you for your testimony. Um, so I have, I have a number of questions. I'll, I'll try to get them out first and you can then try to answer them. Um, again, first of all, the timetable on the uh, drafting of the Constitution and, and do you think that there is a, a, a transition back to democracy, although I'm not really sure after the coup what exactly democracy is in Egypt, but uh, as I said, when we were there, we were told that there was going to be this new constitution, uh, an election for a parliament, and then a election for a president. Um, and the, uh, you expressed, um, I guess, disappointment or frustration over the fact that there has not, peop there's not been a justice system handling of this oppression, uh, is the infrastructure there to do that? That's a great question, uh, Congresswoman Frankel. And uh, I believe the infrastructure is there. They have the, the funds, uh, some of which we give them, that we could tie to that and hold them accountable and show that if they have certain cases that we could identify, whether it's the Mohammed Hagazi case who converted to Christianity and wants his ID to be able to show that, and, and, uh, or another case of an individual who wrote on Facebook criticism, Mohammed has been in jail for three years, or the case of a Shia uh, individual who was imprisoned because he uh, uh, did a ritual that wasn't traditional according to Islam. So there are ways that we could tie uh, representations in their justice system that would show whether they genuinely are moving towards democracy and rule of law or whether it's continuing to be the same old system in Egypt uh, and just shifting around of the chairs on the deck. Well, how, how are the prosecutors and the judges being appointed? Um, you know, the traditional way, I mean, Adli Mansour came out of the Supreme Court uh, uh, system right. there. Um, it is uh, very uh, local oriented and uh, a a historical system in Egypt that is based on uh, a very nepotistic uh, tribal system. Um, it is certainly not a balanced system, and this is one of the things we should uh, look at, as uh, Congressman Conley was pointing out, is do they have a balance of power? Do they have other aspects of democracies that we would hold as standards and are, uh, should be part of their systems and have not been? But that's really beyond our mandate at the uh, commission is I think if you hold accountable uh, standards of international religious freedom, along with it will we'll expose some of these aspects that have put into place and allowed longtime judges. And one of the things the Brotherhood and President Morsi did do was start to put even more radicalization as far as some of the judges. And as he started to replace some of those judges was when you saw a rise of the people against him. Thank you. Mr. Weber. Uh, Chairman Rohrbacher. So here we are in this quandary that uh, we want to make sure that a standard that is an honest standard, not just protection of Christians, but protection of the religious rights of all the people of Egypt um, are protected. And we have just gone through a phase where um, there was a uh, expansion of, of repression and persecution. And we know that that phase was uh, a result of a political 
move towards a certain direction. And those who thwarted that move and thwarted that uh, effort uh, are now in charge. And we, as you say, the timing, if we try to maintain that standard, uh, the timing would have us uh, being tough and perhaps withdrawing some, some of our support from the current group that actually stopped the bad trend. Maybe you could help us out in how we can get out of this quandary. Thank you, Congressman Rohrbacher. Uh, I, I think the way to get out of it is to realize that the Egyptian population is not a victim of basically worse and the worst. And, and the January 2011 revolution was against an era that was repressive and brought forth all of the things that had us designated as a CPC in 2011. And we should have then held them accountable to religious freedom standards at that time. And then it went even worse when democracy was a manifestation of simply elections and became mobocracy rather than principles of religious freedom. So to move forward, I think we have to be principled and, and link our funding to, to demonstrations on the ground, building civil society, uh, uh, having benchmarks at an every 90-day period that show that they are making progress in defending minorities, in protecting churches, in prosecuting those who burn down churches just as quickly as they prosecute free speech issues, which should stop and no longer limit free right. speech. Now, so all of these things can be done. Let me ask you then on this. Uh, there is a... Uh, we are not now selling spare parts to the military for equipment that we provided Egypt in the past, just at a time when there is an expanding um, insurgency or, or, or challenge uh, to peace in the Sinai and elsewhere. Um, are we being, and will we be reviewed as hypocrites about our beliefs in freedom if we, if we uh, provide those spare parts knowing that if this government goes down and those who su succeed uh, in, in these insurgency movements uh, would impose uh, <laughs> harsher restrictions on the people, are we being hypocritical? Uh, well, I don't, I don't believe so because I think that ultimately if we let the world create the narrative of what we're doing at every level, whether it's at spare parts levels or at funding, then it'll appear that way. But if we allow, if our president and our State Department constantly um, makes it clear what the standards of religious freedom are and what we link those to at every speech in the, in the Rose Garden and at every moment the secretary has an opportunity to mention it, then it'll be clear what our standards are. But if we let those go and we lose opportunities and come and make a statement on funding three months later after things happen, then the narrative will be that we're hypocritical. But we should set our own narrative on a daily basis, not on an every quarterly basis. Well, I would hope that we don't do anything that weakens, uh, like like denying spare parts to the right. to the military, weakens their ability not to have even a worse regime come into power. And uh, uh, I would hope we do not do that. But I agree that the United States must really speak with an honest voice on these standards. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Thank you uh, Chairman. Uh, Rob Acker, Mr. Meadows. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for your service to our country, not only here, but uh, in the Navy as well. Uh, we uh, greatly appreciate your insight. Uh, three themes. Uh, one is the inconsistency in terms of the Egyptian people and what they need to look to us in terms of that standard. Uh, I'm, I'm very concerned that over time, uh, the the image of us supporting one regime over the other uh, is very real to the Egyptian people. And, and in light of us trying to address this human rights violations now in terms of religious persecution, uh, the image is out there that we uh, supported the Morsi regime, we don't support this one, when in actuality it, it is more of supporting uh, freedom 
uh, and the respect for rule of law across the board. So how, how do we address that uh, uniquely? And I think the other one is this, is how do we um, have a respect for uh, and, and a love for the Egyptian people and for many of them of a Muslim faith that uh, where it does not get viewed as we're trying to put Christianity and make a Christian Egyptian uh, versus just trying to stand up for those that are being religiously persecuted. I think that's a dangerous tightrope that we walk because the, the perception is many times is that we want our democracy and our religion to be one uh, that's placed on the Egyptian people. So if you could speak to, to those two things, and if we have time, I'll come back for a third question. Thank you, Congressman Meadows. Um, you know, this is so important. I think the paradigm has shifted from the old era in which we simply... Uh, diplomacy was based on the lesser of two evils, and as uh, Secretary Rice said in 2005 in Cairo, that somehow we were choosing, uh, uh, trying to uh, side with security over freedom, and we got neither. And I think ultimately the, the Commission's purpose has been to highlight the fact that religious freedom, when it's lifted up, can then bring with it a more healthy society. And I think how we get our credibility back is to continue to lift that up repeatedly. And uh, the problem is, is there's an opportunity right now. And yes, there will be an image problem because of the loss opportunity in 2011, 2012, and now it appears that somehow our, our standards are to reinforce further authoritarianism. And when in fact what we're doing is laying that out as a course correction in democracy. And the only way we can do that is by siding with the people and siding with principles, because if Regardless of what the, the way the policy is manifesting from the State Department or from the, from the White House, the bottom line is, is the, the majority of Egyptians are not looking favorably at the U.S. these days. And that's because of the lack of clarity in principle and because we haven't sided with the majority of Egyptians that went to the streets that still have a problem not only with the Brotherhood, more so, but still with the current government and are seeking the means to move forward. And we should tie some of that military aid to uh, uh, civil society progress because it's going to take a generation, years to improve these things. It's not going to happen overnight. And and the last point you made about the sort of the sense that this is just a, a, a Christian issue for America, uh, it's not. I think the religious freedom issues of the cops is tied into the Baha'is, is tied into Muslims who are targeted, from Basim Yusuf, who's the John Stewart of Egypt who was targeted, to uh, um, uh, so many of the Shia Muslim community that are called deviants by some of the clerics and judges uh, when in fact they don't have religious freedom to practice their own rights, and others, Muslim uh, dissidents that are part of the majority. The, the millions that went to the street against the Brotherhood were 90% Muslim that did not want the Brotherhood, and we forget that, and our policy should articulate that. Thank you so much. I yield back. Mr. Cotton. Thank you, Mr. President. Could you elaborate just a little bit on the point about the, the majorities that have taken to the street both under uh, the Morsi regime at, at its end and also in the last, uh, last six months since General al-Sisi and the military reclaimed power and how much, if any, of the focus of those majorities is on the issue of religious freedom, religious liberty uh, of minorities there? Well, I think if you follow Facebook traffic, social media, a lot of them have looked at cases uh, uh, like the uh, um, Asfor case, uh, Hagazi case, and others, and see these as individuals that are persecuted, that are, are, are becoming, Basim Yusuf became an icon because he challenged, he was arrested because on his TV program, they, he supposedly was insulting Islam, which they equated to insulting the president. President Morsi. This is the problem not only with the Islamists, but you're finding similar limitations in speech with the, in the Mubarak era and maybe even in the current uh, regime. So these things need to be highlighted and underscored as being one of the primary pathologies that need to be corrected. The majority of people, if you look at their social media and what brings them to the streets, is that they want these issues highlighted by leaders of the free world. In the United States, we have the First Amendment, uh, and it's important. It's first, after all, uh, and it includes religion, uh, freedom of religion and of speech and of press and of assembly. And a certain level, those are all linked in man's God-given ability to reason together. Is there a sense in those majorities in Egypt, in your opinion, that threats to 
the rights of religious minorities are actually uh, threats as well to the political and the speech uh, rights of the majority? In, when we went to Egypt, we met with, uh, in February, uh, we met with a number of different representatives from various religious minority groups, uh, from uh, civil society groups. We met with uh, a, a uh, very impressive uh, uh, women's rights groups, and uh, all of them uh, said how much they saw, they, they dreamed of an Egypt that would bring those principles forward, and that for too long uh, those principles have not been defended from their government and that they seek the means to change that. Now the issue is, is how does that transition, how do they, those principles on the ground transition in the infrastructure and the leadership? And I don't think if the U.S. takes a pass on being open about that, that that's going to happen. I think the West needs to be involved in that transition process and link some of our aid. Now if we decrease our aid, will they get it from elsewhere? They may. Uh, but they still want Western help in doing this, American help, in, because they know the principles that we share in protecting minorities. And the rule of law is important, and this is why some of the cases are so important. What you articulated as our First Amendment respect, many in, in Egypt are still, for decades, have not understood the respect of the rule of law. And that's why we have to tie our relationship to them to cases that respect the rule of law. Mr. Bilirakis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Again, thank you for allowing me to sit on the, the panel today as well. Uh, Mr. Jass Dr. Jassler, thank you for all your good work. I really appreciate it. Of course, thank you for your service to our country as well. Uh, could you speak to how the United States, uh, the State Department, prioritized Coptic, uh, prioritizes Coptic Christians in their approach to the U.S. policy to Egypt? And going, do you think more can be done by the State Department to urge Egypt to respect the rights of religious minorities? Uh, well, certainly when we uh, have uh, engaged uh, uh, the White House and NSC and State Department, uh, they certainly have expressed similar concerns about uh, the targeting of Coptic Christians, and uh, um, in, in our meetings seem to respect that. Now, however, if you look at uh, how frequently it's uh, uh, mentioned publicly and brought uh, from statements uh, from the President or from the Secretary of State, uh, uh, I would say that it's, it's not enough. We sent a letter to the President in uh, September talking about these things, and we have not gotten a response yet uh, from the Secretary or from the President about these issues and our concerns uh, what happened in August uh, to the Coptic community. So I would tell you, uh, as an independent commission that seeks to highlight religious freedom concerns, we have not been uh, as, as happy with the response uh, from the administration as could be in this opportunity to to um, use what has the, the plight of the Coptic community to set Egypt in the right direction for religious freedom as they're moving away from the Brotherhood era, away from uh, some of the mistakes they made after the revolution, but towards a better future rather than back towards what they had during the Mubarak era or some of the same problems that happened under the Brotherhood. Let me ask you a question. Uh, the Coptic community uh, and the Christian uh, community in general, of course, we care about these issues uh, affecting uh, our brothers in Egypt. What can, can the, my constituents do? Uh, what can they do to influence this administration with, rec uh, with respect to this and, and make it a top priority of this administration uh, and the State Department? What would, what would you suggest? I, I think our constituents can do what we are trying to do here, what all of you by being here and listening have done, is to continue to press our State Department, press our not only elected officials, our media, our universities, to recognize what Pew and others have studied repeatedly is the linkage of religious freedom to healthy societies, the linkage of religious repression to sick societies, and that once we highlight that, and, and certainly there are so many other issues on America's plate, but if we ignore this issue, we, societies like Egypt that are pivotal to American security, not only because of uh, Egypt itself, uh, economics, but the Camp David Accords and so many other things will fall apart in the Middle East if we don't protect religious freedom in Egypt. And your constituents, I think, can have a much larger voice than all of us here by reminding their leaders, the media, and others to pay attention to religious freedom. Thank That's you very much. Thank I you. agree 100 percent. Thank All you right. so much. Thank I yield much back. As well. Thank you for your extraordinary testimony, your expertise, uh, and counsel. And uh, we benefit always when you testify.
I'd like to now ask our second panel to make their way to the witness table, beginning first with His Grace, Bishop Angelos, who is the General Bishop of the Coptic Orthodox Church in the United States, United Kingdom, the ancient church of Egypt, and the largest Christian denomination in the Middle East. Uh, Bishop Angelos was born in Cairo, Egypt, and emigrated to Australia during his childhood with his family. In 1990, he returned to Egypt to attend monastery where he was consecrated a monk. In 1995, he was delegated to serve a parish in the United Kingdom with a pastoral ministry that spans almost two decades. The bishop travels extensively around the world to speak at various youth conferences and conventions uh, and is the director of the media and communications office in the United Kingdom and for all of Europe. Uh, we'll then hear from Mr. Samuel Tadros of the Hudson Institute, a research fellow there uh, for religious freedom and a prof prof uh, professorial lecturer at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. His current research focuses on Egypt politics, Islamism, and the fate of religious minorities. Before joining the Hudson Institute in 2011, Mr. Tadros uh, was a senior partner at the Egyptian Union of Liberal Youth, an organization that aims to spread the idea of classical liberalism in Egypt. In 07, he was chosen by the State Department for its first Leaders for Democracy Fellowship Program in collaboration with Syracuse University's Maxwell School. We will then hear from Dr. Uh, Murad Abu Sabi, who is currently Professor Emeritus and Consultant at Rutgers University. Uh, previously, he served as President and Assistant Chancellor for Research and Business Development at Mizir University for Science and Technology, uh, a large private university in Egypt. In his public and community work, he has served on many boards and nationally and internationally and has served as a senior advisor uh, to the Commerce Secretary of the State of New Jersey. In February of 2001, he was nominated for a position in the Office of Secretary of Commerce, and he also has served as president of the Egyptian American uh, Professional Society and numerous other civic organizations. And I had the distinct honor of meeting with him, the, uh, the professor, and a delegation several months ago. Uh, and his insights were, were very, very illuminating, and I thank you, him for that. We'll then hear from uh, Mr. Ted Stanky, who is uh, from Human Rights First, joined it in January 2008, and is Director of Policy and Programs. Prior to joining Human Rights First, he served at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, where he led the Commission's effort to strengthen U.S. foreign policy to advance the right to religious freedom and belief. Mr. Stinky has served on official U.S. delegations to human rights conferences and served as an expert in the international human rights law, training officials from the U.S. Department of State, Justice, and Homeland Security. He has authored and co-authored numerous scholarly publications. And without objection, your full resumes will be made a part of the record. Your Grace, please begin. Chairman Smith, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity, and I'm thankful to all the, the uh, members who are here as well. Um, I must thank you all for braving the weather and coming regardless of all the impediments that must have braved you. Uh, I'm also apologizing for this cold that I have, and I assure you it's not uh, caused by your weather. It's definitely a British import, which I bring. Um, I'm also very thankful for the witness that I've seen here because too far too often, people who walk these corridors, whether in this country or in other places, are accused of being self-interested and they're accused of being uh, following a personal agenda. What we've heard today is a presence and a witness for those who are in need of, of support and are in need of that fraternal uh, relationship. And I, I somehow feel that in light of the last hearing that my uh, presence here is quite superfluous because of everything I've heard and the insight that you, you have. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've also submitted a testimony for the record. Without objection, yours and that of all of our witnesses will be made a part of the record and any extraneous materials you want to add. Thank you. Christians, as everyone knows here, have been part of Egypt's history for, for 2,000 years since the establishment by St. Mark. Um, we are only a numeric minority. We do not consider ourselves a minority group as indigenous people of Egypt. And as was mentioned earlier, and as is absolutely right, the presence of the Christians in the Middle East, the birthplace of Christianity, is not only something we should encourage, but is actually a great, of great importance 
because it is a stabilizing factor in the culture of the Middle East and its identity. I don't only speak here as a Christian because that would be very unchristian of me. We speak as Christians for everyone and our view of human rights is for a human rights uh, perspective that covers everybody. This hearing was postponed for various reasons and it's only providential that it happens today on this day set aside to remember human rights internationally. And I think that is the core of this testimony and the core of what we'll be presenting today. The first attacks on minority groups in Egypt was not on Christians after the uprising, it was on Sufi shrines. We've seen Shiite Muslims killed in the streets. We've seen Baha'is treated unfairly. And so if we are looking at equality issues, we should be looking at equality across the board. During the last administration of former President Morsi, one indication was that in April of this year, the Coptic Orthodox Cathedral was attacked for the first time in known history um, in the presence of police forces then looking on, while uh, a few days earlier, the headquarters of the Freedom Justice Party was attacked and was actually quite substantially protected by the same police force. So it is this culture that we've seen in the past of, of an impunity that leads towards um, a lack of equality. There's a tendency of oversimplification as well, being either pro-military or pro-revolution. Um, the, the presence of Christians is that we are Egyptians before anything else, and that we want a country that actually proposes a movement for all. I issued a statement in August of this year warning that if incitement continued in Rabah al-Adawiyah with the Muslim Brotherhood presence there, there would be widespread attacks on Christians in Christian places. I am not prophetic by any means, but unfortunately only a week later, we saw the attacks on close to 100 churches and Christian institutions in Egypt. That needs a new pragmatic and intentional movement towards democracy. Not just majority rule, which we saw last time, but democracy that represents all. And the new constitution hopefully will take us through that. It will be presented for referendum. What we need to address at the moment are issues of illiteracy and poverty that make constituents vulnerable when they vote and when they are indoctrinated, when they're manipulated either financially or in terms of ideology, and of course religion becomes part of that. What we also need is foreign investment to bring people to actually be able to have a livelihood and support their families. I have seen a lot of um, stick and far too little carrot when speaking about Egypt, in that we are very clear on pointing out shortcomings, but this is a process that countries that have embraced um, democracy for, for centuries are still going through. And so there are steps forward. Um, I have respectfully heard terminology of a military government, whereas this is perceived to be a civilian government. Um, the, the word coup. Uh, we've also looked at the happenings of uh, not only January 25, 2011, but June 30th of this year as an outcry of the Egyptian people, Christian, Muslim, secular, religious, man, woman, young, old, everyone in the streets. And so we are hopeful for a new Egypt as long as there is a pragmatic and proactive, intentional move towards equality. Cases like the Hagazi situation, where we are told there is freedom of religion, yet people cannot really freely choose their religion. We have vested interest in Egypt moving ahead. We have vested interest in Egypt for all Egyptians. We don't just speak as Christians because that, as I said, would be unchristian, but we speak as Egyptians who want as successful a nation as it always has been for millennia. Um, I would, even as a Christian clergyman, love to stop speaking about Christians and Muslims and start speaking about the spirit that we had in January 25, 2011, where there were Egyptian flags flying in Tahrir Square calling for an Egypt. Unfortunately, those intentions 
and that dynamism wasn't capitalized on sufficiently. There were personal agendas brought in, and there was a manipulation of the, that good spirit that then led us down a very, very dangerous path. Egypt has a second chance now, and it, that chance needs to be taken. If we see the same activities of the last presidency follow again, I don't know if we'll have a third chance. We speak as Christians with hope. We have faced persecution far greater than this. We are still there as the biggest Christian nomination in the Middle East, and as the last actual bastion of Christian presence in the Middle East. But above all, we stand as Christians for human rights for all, and for equality, both of right, but also of accountability before a law that respects every person and brings the best out in every person for a nation that em embraces every person. Thank you. Grace, uh, Bishop Angelos, uh, thank you so much for your testimony and for your leadership. Uh, Mr. Tadros. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and honorable members for this holding this hearing and inviting me to speak today. For the past three years, Egypt has witnessed tremendous political change that has resulted in four different regimes ruling the country. Unfortunately, the, under those four regimes, no improvement has taken place on the question of human rights. In fact, there has been a significant deterioration in human rights abuses in the country, especially or significantly regarding Coptic Christians, which will be the focus of my talk today. On the 28th of November, just a couple of days ago, two attacks occurred in two different separate villages in the governorate of Menya. In the first attack, a mob gathered after a rumor of a sexual relationship between a Christian man and a Muslim woman, which resulted in the burning of a couple of Christians' homes, a couple of people being shot, and ransacking and looting of Christian businesses and houses. In the second village, the rumor was not of a sexual relationship, but the apparent crime was a Christian attempting to build on a piece of land that he owns that is viewed as part of the Muslim section of that village. As a result, again, we saw this attack, horrific attacks, pogrom-like attacks, where the mob moves from house to house, searching for the people to kill and attack. In both cases, we've seen a complete absence of the Egyptian police from taking any action to stop those attacks from occurring, nor is there any punishment for those that have, are responsible for them. We've seen again this habit of reconciliation sessions, whereby the victims and those attacking them are put together in a room supposedly to solve their differences outside of the rule of law. Under the Mubarak regime, Christians in Egypt suffered from both official discrimination in terms of exclusion from the public sphere, from government positions, in the police absence to protect them, as well as violent attacks by Islamist groups, especially in the insurgency, Islamist insurgency in the south of the country during the 1990. However, in the last years of Mubarak's rule, we've seen the increasing participation of ordinary citizens in those attacks, mob-like attacks, again, that go completely unpunished and unprevented. After the revolution, those that had hoped that the situation would improve were shocked by the fact that things deteriorated. We've seen a reinforcement of previous patterns of discrimination, as well as an emergence of new patterns, especially when we talk about the new phenomena of the blasphemy laws that was mentioned in earlier testimony, as well as the practice of forced evacuations, where the entire Christian population of a village would be forced to leave as punishment for any affluent that a member of the community is viewed as having um, uh, done. Under the Morsi government, while the Muslim Brotherhood paid lip service to protecting Christians and to uh, inclusion of everyone in the new Egypt, we have seen a constitution that completely excluded Christians from the process of writing it, a constitution that enshrined grave limitations on religious freedom, threats to religious freedom, as well as sectarian rhetoric done by officials in the government, specifically advisors to Mr. Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood ruling party in their official websites against Christians. Christians being blamed for all problems of the country, from train accidents to the continuous deterioration in the security situation. 
As a result, we've seen an encouragement, this um, culture of impunity becoming a culture of encouragement to attacks on Christians, leading up to this massive attack on the Coptic Cathedral, unprecedented in Egypt's history. And after Mr. Morsi's forceful removal by the military from power, we, the Coptic Pope was singled out as the one responsible for the coup. The coup in Egypt is described by the Muslim Brotherhood as the Christian coup. The Christians are the ones behind it. The Christians are the ones that are being presented as leading to it. As a result, we've seen increased incitement against Christians, again, by Muslim Brotherhood websites, official web pages, and in the Muslim Brotherhood demonstrations that have specifically targeted churches in their attacks leading up to the massive attack of Christians on the 14th of August, which is largely the largest attack happening against churches in Egypt since the 13th or 14th century. The new regime's attempt to give the Egyptian police a complete free reign in controlling the Islamist violence, in dealing with the Islamist question, has meant that the Egyptian police has returned to its practices and ability to deal with the Christian portfolio as they like, meaning a return to practices under President Mubarak. I wish to sum up by giving a couple of very clear points about what the situation is um, as we attempt to deal with it. Who is attacking the Christians? Unfortunately, it is ordinary people. It is no longer just Islamist organized groups that are attacking Christians, but it is now possible, it's now very likely that ordinary citizens are participating in those pogroms. Why are they attacking the Christians? The reasons vary. Sometimes it's the sexual rumor of a relationship between a man and a woman. Sometimes it's the rumor that the Christians are attempting to build a church. Sometimes it's an, a, a fruent to Islam, an insult perceived by a Christian member to Islam. Sometimes it's just a land dispute. But whatever the reason, we get the situation of the mob gathering, attacking the Christians, going home to home, looting, burning, searching for people to kill. Now with the deteriorating security situation, an increased resortation to or availability of guns, leading to higher um, uh, deaths in those situations. The government action, there has been no prevention attempt of stopping those attacks. There has been inadequate, once the troops arrive, when they arrive late, there are inadequate troops to deal with the situation. They lack any established security protocol to deal with such pogroms or such attacks. They resort to random arrests of both Christians and Muslims, whereby they attempt to pressure both communities into then those reconciliation sessions and attempt to remove the immediate trigger by, for example, stopping the Christians from building the church or uh, removing the family that is viewed as insulting Islam from the village. The national government has, done, has no political will at all to address the root causes of this violence in Egypt or to deal with the larger question. As an example to cite, on the 4th and 5th of July 2013, a mob gathered in the village of Naga Hassan Luxor to start this attack on Christians. They went from house to house searching for the Christians, finally found them hidden in one house. They attempted to attack, the police arrived. The police, instead of saving those Christians from death, then negotiated with the mob and reached an agreement whereby the women and children would be saved and the men would be left to die. The women begged the police officers. They fell on the police officers' legs, begging him to save their husbands. He said no, he had given his word to the mob. As the police was leaving the room, the men were butchered. Four men were killed in that house that day. When asked by Human Rights Watch later on, the head of the Egyptian security in the governorate of Luxor, Major Khaled Hassan, replied as to what had happened, that he saw nothing wrong with the police performance. According to him, and that's a direct quote, there was no reason for the police to take any special measures. It's not the police's job to stop killings. We just investigate afterwards. I'd be happy to discuss what can be done about it in the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Mr. Tadros, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Abu Sabi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to... Uh, yeah. 
Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this uh, uh, hearing, and I really appreciate uh, you know get, getting that opportunity here. Uh, my emphasis in my statement is really not so much uh, about uh, Christians and you know human rights abuses for Christians, because I believe that the uh, Mercy government had actually abused the, the rights, the human rights of all Egyptians. And that is really, I think, something that should really be pointed out. Uh, so uh, my focus is really more uh, coming into uh, U.S.-Egyptian uh, relationships and the, you know, the, the basis for which uh, many of these things have happened. So I say that the events of June 30th, uh, 2013 in Egypt, which resulted in the ouster of uh, former, uh, former Egyptian President uh, Mohamed Morsi, were in response to the massive and unprecedented uh, protests by the Egyptian people. Morsi's overthrow was supported by and facilitated by the Egyptian military. Since, ministry, uh, since Morsi's ouster, the U.S.-Egyptian relations have gone through abrupt changes that threatened and continue to threaten the special relationship between the two countries. Now, just for, some, for a short historical perspective on how we got, to, uh, we got this special relationship, one can only begin to, to, to by crediting the late Egyptian uh, President Anwar Sadat for the start of this relationship. When Sadat took his unimaginable and bold steps in, in the 1970s, which were essentially ending the Egyptian-Soviet relationship and expelling the Russian advisors on July 18, 1972, and then making his historic trip to Israel on November 20, 1977, no one understood at the time what he was doing or where he was heading. Sadat ended Egypt's relationship with the Soviets at the time that he was preparing for the 1973 war with Israel. However, Sadat knew and was convinced that the Arab-Israeli conflict could, not, could only be resolved by the United States and that all uh, that matters to the U.S. in the region were Israel and uh, the flow of Middle East oil. Taking these bold steps to that uh, put Egypt in the most precarious position that resulted in his own assassination by the Muslim Brotherhood and the uh, uh, isolation of Egypt for many years uh, afterwards from the rest of the Arab world. Since then, and especially after the signing of the Camp David Accord uh, and the peace treaty with Israel, the U.S.-Egyptian relations, uh, however, became, uh, has been at their most cordial levels. This, this cordial relationship, as it may now have become clear, was particularly for keeping the Egyptian-Israeli uh, treaty safe. It did not matter uh, what the U Mubarak 30-year dictatorship had done to Egypt or the Egyptian people as long as the peace treaty was safe. Now, with the January 25th uh, revolution uh, in Egypt, the U.S. administration aligned itself with the Muslim Brotherhood uh, as the most organized group among all the political parties and political organizations in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood were deemed to have the highest likelihood of to step in the governance of Egypt. This new relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood, especially after Morsi's election to the presidency, presidency was further strengthened when Morsi was able to secure a ceasefire uh, uh, between Hamas and Israel in November 22, 2012. It can be assumed that in this close relationship, the U.S. administration saw the possible, possible venues for the resolution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, while the MB, MBs, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, saw the possibility of moving forward with the Renaissance project with the help of the United States. This view is supported by for example, one, the unusual cl close relationship between the American ambassador uh, in Cairo and the Muslim Brotherhood organization outside of President Morsi himself, a matter that caused uh, resentment among the many Egyptians and political party leaders. It was most evident when the U.S. ambassador took upon herself to meet with the Muslim Brotherhood officials who had no official status in the Egyptian government. It further confirmed that Morsi was, in fact, the figurehead and that decisions came from the MBA leadership office at Al Mukattam district in Cairo. In the meantime, the Muslim Brotherhood and President Morsi were working on establishing legal rights for the Palestinians in northern Sinai to buy land and settle uh, in the northern Sinai as a prelude to Hamas expansion into the Sinai. One of the vehicles for achieving that 
was to grant Egyptian citizenship to as many as 50,000 Palestinians in one stroke. Former President Morsi was able to do so by changing the Egyptian law that defined Egyptian citizenship, which applied only to those all persons born in Egypt to Egyptian fathers. Morsi and the MB simply changed the law to allow all those born to Egyptian mothers to become Egyptian citizens, opening the door for thousands and thousands of Palestinians whose mothers were of Egyptian nationality. Simply, uh, simply uh, it is not. Now the Egyptian government is trying to review uh, these uh, newly acquired uh, citizenships. Egypt to Mercy was nothing but a, and a Muslim brotherhood did not matter. There was, no uni uh, there was no understanding of Egyptian sovereignty or defined borders. It was just land that they could deal and hand over to anybody they wanted. Now, the impact of the, US, the immediate position taken by the United States government in response to Mercy's ouster was to call it a military coup, and Congressman Franklin just continued to repeat that now. As, as, and based on that, the administration initiated the process of suspending U.S. military aid to Egypt. Such a response by the administration represented a clear departure from the U.S. long-standing position in support of Egypt. It also showed another side to the administration's foreign policy towards Egypt. It showed that the newly developed alliance between the U.S. and Muslim Brotherhood organization and the Morsi government, as I pointed out above. Such unlikely relationship was a great surprise and disappointment to all Egyptians who did not understand why would the U.S. partner with an Islamic group that has historically been implicated in the types of violence that is characteristic of Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. On the ground, the U.S. administration condemns the military overthrow of Morsi and cautioned the Egyptian government against the use of, uh, of, of uh, the, the, against the use of force in dealing with the peaceful protesters. Little did Washington know that the, the Muslim Brother protests and sit-ins were actually militarized, not peaceful. There was no holdback by the Muslim Brotherhood leadership from issuing their numerous public threats uh, from their own stage, uh, stage platforms uh, and on live television of the dire results if any attempts were made to evict them. These were the peaceful protesters who were constantly reported by the New York Times and other US reports, reporters in Egypt. You could only see the contradiction between the, what the US media reported and what every Egyptian, including myself, watching from here, was viewing directly and live on Egyptian satellite television while listening to the MB's threats. There was no hesitation on the part of the Muslim Brotherhood protest leadership to admit their role in the terrorism against the Egyptian military and security that was going taking place in, in the Sinai. As they continued to make pronouncements, if the Egyptian government yields to our demands, all violence in Sinai would immediately stop. There was no peace. These were the peaceful protesters the administration was supporting and the U.S. media was reporting. There was also a, a human cost to the, US, to the U.S. support of the MBs. Namely, it cost hundreds of Egyptian lives that were lost from both protesters as well as the security forces during the forcible eviction of, of the Syrians. These lives could have been saved if the Muslim Brotherhood did not count on the U.S. support and would have at least allowed the eight-week mediation efforts by the international community to succeed. To this day, the MBs believe that they, are, they, were, they were the aggrieved rather than the aggressor uh, and the cause of the violence that they per perpetrated. They continue to hold uh, uh, violent protests, block roads, and instigate Egy the Egyptian people irrespective of their unrealistic expectation of Morsi's return uh, to office. In the meantime, former President Morsi was held in custody for several months before he was charged in court on the 4th of November and was subsequently remanded to prison uh, awaiting uh, trial, uh, you know, slated for January 2014. Among the alleged charges against Morsi are incitement to, to murder and more importantly the charge of espionage, uh, having colluded with international organization against the interest and security of Egypt. There is a, currently a, a, a gag order uh, on discussions of, the, the, of these particular cases. The conflicting signals by the administration with statements from the State Department yield holding on to the U.S.-Egyptian relations while at the same time other U.S. officials confirmed, uh, continued to call the ouster a military coup. 
played a major part in the uh, resistance to, of the MBs to, uh, to, to any kind of mediation and resolution. Significant among those were the statements by Senator John McCain and Lindsey Graham, who visited Egypt in July and met with Mercy. After their meeting, they came out and in a press conference once again called the ouster of a, a military coup. In fact, Senator John McCain, in his comments, predicted the civil war in Egypt uh, as a result. Luckily, this prediction has not uh, happened, at least until now. These reactions and contradiction statements by U.S. officials simply confirmed the ambivalence of the U.S. foreign policy towards Egypt. Not only that, but it also implied that the U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East has changed and that a new agenda may be under development as we speak. The same ambivalence was demonstrated by the same U.S. administration after the January 25th revolution in Egypt, which resulted in the resignation of, of the U.S. Uh, long-standing ally, Mubarak. The unyielding question remains, why was there a relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood and what was the purpose of aligning ourselves with, with a terrorist organization with a long documented history uh, that, uh, that backs it up? What was our ulterior motive behind this relationship that we would undertake at the expense of an ally uh, and a regional power like Egypt? Morsi's one year term uh, in June 26, uh, 2013, and before Morsi's ouster, a, uh, a report signed by some 20 human rights organizations was published by the Cairo Institute of Human Rights Studies uh, assessing the one-year rule uh, under Morsi. The report was entitled, One Year uh, into Mohammed Morsi's Term, Manifold Abuses of the Sy and the Systematic uh, Undermining of the Rule of Law. In this report, the many facts uh, uh, facets of human rights abuses were, report, were reported and undertaken by the Mercy government in, in that. I yeah, did, uh, Abu Sabi, uh, we, um, yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm, we're I'm, going to have to leave the I'm room at 11 o'clock okay. because right. there's going to be a sweep of the room because Senator Curry okay. uh, will be coming in shortly thereafter. Okay. If you could just sum up and then, I'll, I'll Mrs. Up. Tenke, and then we'll go to some very quick questions. Yes, sir. Thank I'll, you, sir. I'll sum up essentially in just a couple of uh, we therefore call, uh, as Egyptian Americans, we therefore call upon the President and the Congress to carefully examine our role in fostering peace and stability in Egypt. It is imperative upon us to, uh, to take the lead in establishing a close relationship with the government and the peoples of Egypt. We need to be mindful of the facts behind the events before jumping to conclusions and taking other drastic measures as those that have been taken. We also uh, call upon the U.S. media to bring the truth behind the, the violence that, that is perpetrated by the terrorists and so forth. Thank you very much. Dr. Abu Sabi, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Stinky. Yes, thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, Madam Chairwoman, thank you for convening this hearing, uh, for your leadership on human rights in the Congress, members of the subcommittees. Thank you as well, and we look forward to working with both subcommittees. Uh, to try to advance human rights protections in an increasingly volatile Egypt. Uh, the rapidly deteriorating situation of Egypt's Coptic Christian minority is an alarming symptom of an unresolved and worsening political crisis. If left to fester, this crisis could further destabilize Egypt and the region, as well as hold back the possibility of economic and political reform and the protection of human rights and be profoundly harmful to the interests of the United States and our allies. As you've heard, uh, there's been an unprecedented escalation in attacks against Coptic Christians since August 14th, when the military violently dispersed those protesting President Morsi's ouster. Discrimination against members of religious minorities, incidents of sectarian violence that go largely unpunished, anti-Christian incitement and anti-Semitism have unfortunately long been a feature of Egyptian life. But the political polarization of the past few months has taken violence against Christians to unprecedented levels. Many have been killed. Well over 100 churches, homes, and other properties have been attacked. Perpetrators have not been brought to justice. Um, in addition, members of other religious minorities have been attacked and continue to be persecuted, including Baha'is, uh, Shia, and Sufi Muslims.
It's the great misfortune of the Christian Coptic community that they are pawns in a highly destructive zero-sum political game between the Muslim Brotherhood and the military-backed national security state. The Morsi government bears considerable blame for fueling a climate of anti-Christian intolerance when its rhetoric became increasingly paranoid and Christians were among the forces said to be conspiring against it. And following Morsi's overthrow, his supporters openly blamed the cops for it, claiming that Christian hostility to Islam and the idea of a Muslim Egypt led them to conspire with the military and hostile foreign powers like Israel and the United States. This demonization of Christians has made the community more vulnerable to the violence that has followed. But at the same time, the military-backed government seems more interested in pointing to anti-Christian violence as evidence of Muslim Brotherhood extremism than in taking effective measures to protect Christians from attack. This posture of pointing to the violent excesses of Islamic extremists as an excuse to resist their own reforms is a familiar throwback to the days of Mubarak. The Egyptian authorities under the SCAF, under Morsi, and under the current government have failed to protect the Coptic community and to hold accountable those who incite and commit sectarian violence. The current government needs to do so. It should also remove long-standing restrictions on religious freedom, such as abusive blasphemy laws and the decrees banning Baha'is and Jehovah's Witnesses. It should enact a non-discriminatory law for the construction and repair of places of worship. But these recommendations alone, we fear, are inadequate as a response to the crisis now confronting Egypt's Coptic community, and by extension, all Egyptians. The current government and the security apparatus are largely made up of the same people who've held power in Egypt for decades. They are unlikely to change their ingrained habits on sectarian issues, and may even see some advantage in assaults against Christians continuing because it supports their narrative. Thus, there needs to be progress towards a political solution in Egypt, one that includes movement toward political reconciliation as a first step. But reconciliation is a challenge, as the current government has engaged in a brutal and wide crackdown against the Muslim Brotherhood and its supporters, and has also repressed non-Islamist critics and repressed fundamental freedoms of speech and assembly. We detail the deterioration of the human rights situation throughout the transition period, and especially since Morsi's overthrow in our written statement. Government force implicated in the mass, uh, is implicated in the mass killings of hundreds of protesters since August 14th, the wholesale roundup of Muslim Brotherhood political leaders on sweeping charges of involvement in violence or terrorism, intensifying restrictions on the media and harassment of government critics, the increased use of military trials against civilians and incommunicado detention leading to torture. This is all familiar. Um, the security, uh, the state security apparatus is back, uh, promoting a climate of fear uh, under the rubric of a war on terrorism. And to make matters worse, all this is taking place against the backdrop of a breakdown in the rule of law and the deterioration of state institutions, uh, which began under the SCAF and continued under Morsi. A polarized, increasingly violent Egypt is a serious problem for the United States. The White House says that they are undertaking a thorough review of Egypt policy, and we welcome that. Indeed, supporting repressive governments in spite of its abuses has failed in the past, and a major shift in U.S. policy is needed to one that puts Egypt's commitment to human rights and democratization at its core. We've set out several recommendations for U.S. policy in a policy blueprint um, published last week. Uh, but let me end by suggesting a few of those recommendations. Working with its donor partners, the United States must establish sizable, sustained economic incentives for Egypt leaders, including IMF loans, which should be conditioned, conditioned on Egypt adhering to human rights standards. The administration suspended some military aid following the coup and their right to set human rights conditions on full resumption of aid to Egypt. If it wishes to benefit from a close cooperative relationship with the United States, the Egyptian military must use its power to move Egypt back onto a path of peaceful, peaceful inclusive, civilian-led governance. And this necessarily entails some form of reconciliation. Some supporters of President Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood should be let back into the political process. Credible Islamic leaders need to condemn violence against religious minorities, 
and there's a reduced incentive to do so when thousands are in jail, frozen out of the political process, and indiscriminately labeled as extremists and terrorists. We shouldn't ask Egyptians to com uh, accommodate Islamists who espouse violence or hatred, but leaving the large part of the Egyptian electorate that wishes to support an Islamist political party in elections, leaving them disenfranchised, is not a recipe for stability. The United States should publicly promote reconciliation and continue to try to initiate a process to advance it. And finally, the State Department and USAID should increase its efforts bilaterally and or multilaterally to fund independent civil society organizations with the capacity to monitor government institutions and expose official wrongdoing, as well as promote religious pluralism and, toler and, and, and tolerance. There are many influential voices in Egypt who are suspicious of the U.S. government's commitment to democracy. The embassy in Cairo needs to continue to show that. In Washington, they continue, need to continue to show it. The Congress continues to need to speak out about it. Um, and the U.S. should be working with other like-minded uh, governments uh, to bring about a successful uh, political reform in Egypt. Thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Stanky, thank you so very much for your testimony. Again, we're going to have to leave the room shortly because of the uh, security sweep uh, in anticipation of Secretary Curry's uh, trip. So what I thought, all of us uh, on the panel uh, will go through a few questions, and if you could take notes, we'll do it all at once, and then you answer those questions as you see fit. Uh, Bishop An Angelos, if I could just say, you mentioned um, the kidnapping of Coptic Christian girls, which is an issue that I chaired three hearings on. And Congresswoman, Chairwoman Ilana Ross Layton was there at each of those hearings. Uh, we did not get good answers back from the administration. Matter of fact, they failed to raise those issues in any substantive way. Could you speak to that very briefly? And, and there are many other issues I'd like to ask you, but time does not permit it. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Abu Sabi, uh, you mentioned the close relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, if who advised the administration, uh, if you know? Uh, to do that. You know, I remember when you briefed me in my office several months ago, you went to great historical lengths to tell me and my staff uh, what the true underpinnings of that organization is and, and the hostility that they bear to so many, including other Muslims, uh, if you could speak to that. Uh, if I could, um, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Stanky, about the suspicious nature of many towards the U.S. government. It didn't help that when the President spoke at the United Nations, he talked about our core interests, including Camp David Accords and counterterrorism, and no mention, as far as I could tell, whatsoever of human rights. So uh, if you could speak to that as well. And finally, um, um, the forced reconciliation issue that uh, Mr. Tedros, you spoke to, it seems to me that law enforcement should be all about enforcing the law. Somebody commits a murder, a rape, burns down somebody's house, you arrest, you prosecute, and then you jail based on the evidence. You don't force a cop to Christian or the victim into a, quote, reconciliation, if you could elaborate on that. Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I want to thank our panel for their testimony. Uh, many of these issues are, are heart-wrenching issues. Um, and uh, as my friend Ileana ross Leighton knows, I was a Senate staff member uh, for 10 years. And every time uh, President Mubarak appeared before our committee. Uh, I worked for Claiborne Pell uh, at the time. Uh, we forcefully uh, tried to make the case on behalf of minorities, especially Coptic Christians in Egypt, uh, and the house arrest of Pope Shenouda and other issues. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's a little bit uh, troubling that those same issues haven't changed. Um, in fact, maybe have gotten worse. I will say, however, uh, Human rights are human rights, whether you're a Copt or a Muslim. The fact of the matter is hundreds, if not more, of Egyptians have been slaughtered on the streets of urban Egypt since the, since the military coup. I had a constituent come to see me last week. He had to pick up his brother. He's an American citizen. He had to pick up his brother back in Cairo. He was shot in the head, one bullet. He went to visit the morgue. There were dozens of bodies from protests, street protests, shot in the head. 
And interestingly, the death certificate said, died of natural causes. And it's an elaborate process to get the police to redo the death certificate if you want the body. And if you're a Muslim, that's a big deal. You're a Christian too, but there are time limits. Very elaborate process to go to the police and get them to admit this was homicide, not a natural cause. The trauma is extensive. And I say that both Muslims and cops and others in Egypt are suffering today. And I would hope, Bishop Angelos, that in the Christian view you and I share, it encompasses the violation of the human rights of Muslims as well as cops, because in, their, in your safety is also theirs, and in theirs is also yours. And I wonder if you might comment a little bit about that from your perspective. And Mr. Stanky, I thank you so much for acknowledging uh, those points, because I think as we move forward <laughs> in the United States, we've got to deal with the political reality of how do you put together a coalition that can work moving forward that encompasses all of the points of view of Egypt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Two questions, one on the draft constitution and the second on, on the NGOs. As we know, Morsi rammed through uh, a constitution that severely restricted all rights, women's rights, uh, religious rights, uh, ethnic rights. And although the referendum passed, it only had a 33% a voter turnout. Now we've got this draft constitution. In theory, it recognizes uh, the rights of Jews and Christians and Muslims, but uh, leaves on other religious minorities, such as the Baha'i community, unprotected. What can we do to ensure that the new constitution would not restrict of the uh, fundamental rights of any Egyptian and that real progress is made, not just in theory, but in practice. And on the NGO convictions, uh, they still have not been overturned. Uh, the draft NGO law that's proposed will have many of these NGOs still fearful that uh, they should, if, if they continue operating in Egypt. Uh, what can we in the U.S. do to ensure that the Egyptians have what they need to build the capacity foundation for a strong democracy? What do you think that the future of the NGOs will be? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Frankel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I just want to say that um, for for me, the the I, I say freedom of religion is like is like uh, the H two O of of human rights. It's uh, what water is to the body for many people. Freedom of religion is the water of their for their soul. So I, I want to emphasize that. And so uh, w when I was in Egypt, I think I think I met I mentioned that I, we met with Coptic Pope. Tawadros, I'm saying the name right, the second. He shared stories with us of the burning of the churches and the oppression, uh, showed us photos and so forth. So my first question is, do you believe that this concept of freedom of religion is recognized universally in Egypt? Is it something that most Egyptians even know or feel? And uh, then the, the other uh, issue I'd like you to comment on, and I think it was uh, raised by Mr. Rohrbacher, I think he was getting there, uh, which is, you know, this, this, uh, there's a concept called first do no harm. And so um, my, my second question would be really is what about Israel, the stability of the Middle East, if there's been some suggestions of us perhaps which were in support or uh, having certain conditions for support of the military. And, and then I, I would like you to comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if I could get <laughs> these questions answered uh, to my staff, I guess. Um, they're not going to comment later. Is that right, Mr. Chairman? We're out of time. Oh, they are going to comment. Okay. Uh, for each of you, what do you view as the greatest hope of the, the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims? And then how do we, what, what is their greatest hope, and how do we reconcile those differences? And that's pretty simple, isn't it? And I yield back. Jimmy Rohrbacher. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, here we are stuck with... Uh, 
trying to figure out uh, whether we're going to use our heads or whether we're going to use our hearts, and whether there's, whether there's a contradiction <clears throat> in America's soul about these very questions that we're ta talking about today. Uh, we must obviously be committed to our ideals, and uh, yet we must also understand if we do not have a commitment to a practical policy, we could end up bringing the world and bringing ourselves to the opposite of what our ideals uh, would have us go. I, so I would suggest then finally, uh, where does this all land us for this hearing? And that is, and I would just like to state and get your opinion on it, uh, denying spare parts uh, to the Egyptian army at this moment would not lead to a better world and to a better situation in Egypt. And uh, that's my analysis of it. What is your response to that? And Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I will just ask each of you to, to submit for the record, if you would, f where the Egyptian people view five inconsistencies in U.S. foreign policy. Inconsistencies. And so where do the Egyptian people see where we're saying one thing and doing another? If you could do that, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your Grace, if you could begin, and each of our distinguished witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On, on the view of the kidnapping of girls, of course, as has been mentioned numerous times, there is an inequality before the law. And so the way that uh, matters are investigated sometimes depends on who is on the receiving end of the alleged criminal action. <coughs> Excuse me. And so <coughs> I think what we've seen is in times there have been forced conversions, there have been forced kidnappings. Um, at those times, security forces have been reluctant to investigate. Even if the outcome of the investigation is this was an intentional action or it was um, a, a personal choice, yet the investigation needs to be transparent, needs to be honest. And we haven't seen those. What we have seen is where calls have been made in particular cases that have been proven to be forced they have been set aside because there have been a desire not to cause offense to particularly majority Muslim areas where that could cause trouble for the security forces. So they are, just as in the case where people were attacked in their homes and this deal was struck, sometimes similar things are done to ensure that there is some sort of uh, equilibrium um, kept at the expense of the Christian uh, community there, of course. Mr. Tadros. Uh, a couple of on the, on the general questions. I think um, there's definitely huge abuses of human rights in Egypt, not only to Christians, as the honorable member pointed out, the, the massacre of Muslim Brotherhood supporter was probably the largest such massacre in Egyptian history. And it's an extremely polarizing event. Um, I know it's easy to talk of the Egyptian people, but there are divisions within those people. The Muslim Brotherhood continues to have supporters. Exact figures are hard to tell, of course, because we didn't have an election. Um, street demonstrations are hard to count and hard to determine who has more supporters on the street. So there's a continuous polarization today in Egypt, and there is no plan on how to solve that situation. Egypt is not transitioning to democracy. It's, there is an attempt to rebuild an uh, authoritarian regime with some changes as to uh, differentiating it from what was under Mubarak, but there is no attempt to create a serious democracy in Egypt at all. Um, there are, people have a lot of anger, both sides in Egypt have a lot of anger towards the United States. And part of it is simply conspiracy theorizing and um, active propaganda by the various groups, whether it's the Muslim Brotherhood or the Egyptian military, to paint the United States as an enemy and to use that as an attempt to shore support for their various sides. Specifically to the rule of law, I think there has been a lot of focus on general words. We need to have a general situation where people uh, in Egypt are all treated equally. These are all nice words and 
but the, the important thing is specifics that can deal with that situation. I I'm, would like to suggest a few. First, identification. It, it doesn't take a genius to identify what are the most vulnerable villages in Egypt that are likely to witness attacks. Um, experts on the situation of Christians in Egypt could have told you before the 14th of August that the governorate of Menia was likely to, face the, to have the most attacks. So a process needs to be there where the 100 most vulnerable villages can be identified. The Egyptian government should be urged to do that. The U.S. might be able to help, uh, giving resources to help that process of happening. So that's important to prevent those attacks from happening in the first place. Secondly, the Egyptian police needs to have a security protocol to deal with mob violence. The, again, if this situation has been repeating itself one time after the other, there needs to be a clear security protocol on how to deal with those specific incidents. Thirdly, a crisis office in the Egyptian presidency that has actual power to deal specifically with that issue so that it's not an issue left to each a local governor or local police station to deal with, but there is a headquarters that deals with it. Fourthly, a rapid response unit, whereby once a situation is created in one of those villages, and that office immediately sends a rapid response unit to deal with that situation in the village. Fifth, the reform of the legal system in terms of having actual punishment, giving up on those reconciliation sessions, punishing those people that attack the Christians. Lastly, a localized reward and punishment system. Again, if the governorate of Menia witnesses the most attacks on Christians and the local authorities there are not willing to protect the religious minorities or the worst violators of human rights, then probably the governorate of Menia should not be receiving U.S. funding through U.S. aid. Perhaps the governorate of Sohag, where it, which has a better performance on those issues, would get more U.S. aid funding on that regard. So localizing both punishment and rewards for the governorates in an attempt to enforce the local uh, governors and the local authorities to deal with those specific issues. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Avasabi. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Uh, the first question, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, your first question is, is, is uh, uh, about what was behind this. And it, it's really, uh, I don't really have any particular evidence, but what, has the, what the you know, news media in Egypt have reported on uh, throughout uh, earlier this year, uh, essentially that there may have been uh, some sort of, a, of a, an agreement of sorts uh, for uh, uh, more, or less, more or less annexing a portion of the northern Sinai with Gaza uh, for the benefit of this, uh, the, the solution of the Palestinian-Israeli problem. And in essence, that that portion of the Sinai was going to be used to uh, allow additional Palestinians you know, to come in to so forth. And that, that really was, so the Muslim Brotherhood was essentially the uh, entity uh, that came in the right time that would allow that to happen uh, because of its close relationship with Hamas and all of that. And the idea was essentially to, to establish an, uh, an, an arc of, quote-unquote, moderate Islamic states, uh, essentially, you know, between Egypt, uh, Gaza, and uh, Turkey. And, and obviously that all was really uh, very, very incorrect uh, and, and, and bad. Uh, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the U.S. foreign policy, the, the question that was asked about U.S. foreign policy, I think it's important that uh, uh, there is a whole feeling in Egypt in, among the people that you know, people are like you know, conspiracies in, in essence. That there's a fear that the U.S. may be, uh, as well as other countries, may be uh, embarking on a redefining of the Middle East. And I think uh, uh, I mean, um, Secretary Condoleezza Rice uh, uh, had publicly stated in many situations that uh, we are draw, redrawing. We're going to be, you know, we're create. We're going to create some some uh, uh, chaos and some havoc, and there may be some instability. And as a, out of this instability, we might end up with some democracy. And maybe with the democracy that we get, then we need to really redraw the map of the Middle East in the way that we can actually uh, uh, have an impact on the outcome itself. So I mean, it's a very long story, but. Uh, that these, the suspicion is there. And I'm not in agreement with people that say uh, uh, that the aid is an essential uh, part uh, for Egypt. I think 
It is not. Uh, uh, it, is, it is really the relationship and the support for the development of the country, allowing the country to utilize its resources, allow it to use its human resources, is very, very important in Egypt. And the last point that I will say, essentially, religious freedom, uh, the question I uh, was asked about religious freedom, Islam uh, came to Egypt 1,400 years ago. And until the Muslim brothers came into the picture last year and a half or two years, everybody in Egypt had uh, uh, the, uh, the full opportunity to practice his religion, whatever it was. I, and I grew up in Egypt, and when I was in the grade school and high school, most of my friends were Christians, and actually I had a, a Jewish friend as well, Eliyahu Kohen. And uh, we, we never, never had any difference. My name is Borad, which is not an Islamic name. I was many, many times confused that I was also a cop. So it, it was not an issue until the Muslim brothers came in. And that's why it is important to really recognize that. Freedom of religion in Egypt is there, always, has always been there. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Stenke. Thank you. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, we uh, think it was unfortunate that the president did not mention human rights in his UN uh, speech. Uh, that was a missed opportunity to be clear about what the United States stands for. And this administration and previous ones have shown an ambivalent relationship to promoting human rights and democracy in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt and in the region. And we're hoping that the policy review that the administration says that it's undertaking will make it clear uh, and actually reorder uh, U.S. Uh, uh, priorities to, um, to focus more clearly on uh, democratic and human rights developments. Now, the President's comments do, I think, get a little bit to what uh, the question Mr. Rohrbacher had uh, about uh, in terms of our, our, our head and our hearts. But in my view, um, there's a difference between spare parts uh, and aid for the Egyptians to conduct counterterrorism and border security, and even some of the specific things that Mr. Tadros mentioned about protecting civilians. There's a difference between that and uh, sort of prestige uh, weapon systems, uh, some sort of um, uh, uh, false sense of you know, balance of military uh, power. I, I think that the U.S. aid relationship uh, can be uh, looked at and reformed and, and reordered to bring about a mix of carrots uh, and sticks, um, conditions, but also the promise for significant economic development. I think the bishop mentioned that, you know, the, the country is in dire need of economic development. Uh, and, you know, the Saudis can give cash, uh, but the West uh, can bring about investments. Uh, stability can help bring about tourism again in the country. Uh, this is the type of econo economic development that the country needs and that the, the United States and its Western partners and the IMF uh, can, uh, uh, can bring about, um, but they should do it in a phased way in response to serious uh, reforms on some of the human rights issues that Mr. Connolly mentioned as well as the religious freedom issues that we're talking about today. Thank you, Mr. Stinky. Uh, again, because of the sweep that's pending for Senator Curry's um, or Secretary Curry's testimony, um, the hearing is adjourned. And I want to ask everyone if they could leave the room immediately so they can come in and do the sweep. And I thank you so much for your tremendous insights and for your expert testimony. Hearing is adjourned.